We left off at verse 4, Genesis chapter 18 and verse 4. The Bible says, and remember Abraham, he is speaking to the angel of the Lord, or God, and the two other angels. So at verse 4, he's saying, let a little water, I pray you, be fetched. So he's pleading with them, I urge you, I pray you, that's I urge you, that I bring some water for you. Just a little bit of water, he said. Now, fetch is still a word that people use today when they say to a dog, go fetch, right? So for people to say that the King James Bible, they use archaic words, they themselves don't realize that they also use the words themselves in modern day. So you'd be surprised those archaic words are actually modern for today. And wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. So Abraham insists, let me wash your feet uh, with that little water that I bring, and then you can rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread. So Abraham says, not only just water, I'm also going to bring, fetch, a morsel of bread. So a piece of bread. Now, that might be uh, simplistic to think, that the passage is talking about bringing a piece of bread, but I'll tell you something, it's some piece of bread. <laughs> it's much bigger than you thought. Now, it's kind of interesting, he says a little water, right here at verse 4, and then more soul of bread. Now, why would he use that kind of language at verse 4 and 5? If you're serving the Lord, you probably want to serve him a big, uh, a big portion of meal, and use a huge, a large quantity of water. Well, because the language here at verse 4, he's saying, I pray you. And then verse 3, I pray you again. Don't pass away from me. So it seems like Abraham knows that God can pass by him because usually with people, sometimes in this country as well, you don't want to be stopped. You don't want to be interrupted. You're busy. You're preoccupied in doing your own thing. So Abraham being such a gracious host that he is, is like, just have a little bit of break with me. That's how much I want to spend time to serve you. Now that's a servant's heart right there. A huge servant's heart right there is where he is considerate of God's business. If there's a person of a very important position, you don't just invite them to your place to stay so easily, right? Why? Because they're too big for you. Yeah. But if you really want to spend time with that person, you find ways to persuade them and then you would plead with them and you would also say just a little bit of meal. So it's very important that when we have such a deep, intimate fellowship with God, like Abraham, he had a very close relationship with God. But Abraham, even though he, uh, he has such a close relationship with God, he doesn't think, I'm going to use up all my time with you. I have the right to do that with you. Now, it is true, we Christians, God has gave, given us the privilege and rights to fellowship with him. But to be very honest, you don't have a legitimate right. If it wasn't for your salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I have no right at all. If you recall your humble beginnings, your position, who you are and who God is, just like how you would treat very important people on earth, you should do more so with God, who's way more important than any other important person on earth. So be considerate of God's business like, Lord, would you just hear me out a little bit right here? And then what Abraham did was, he actually took advantage of it and given them a huge portion of meal, not a little one. That's what you should be doing with God is be so considerate of his business, but take every opportunity to like spoil him rotten, if that makes any sense, to please him very well, as you would to any important figure if you want to persuade them to come to your home. I hope this is making some sense to you. Now, if Abraham said a morsel of bread, a piece of bread, we have to understand it's much more than that, and I'm going to show it later on at verse 6. It's a huge meal, and verse 7. 
If you look at verse 7, a morsel of bread is actually referring to a meal. It's not just bread itself. Now, bread and meal are going to go interchangeably, I want you to understand, in the Bible. A lot of times when the Bible says meal, it can refer to bread. When the Bible says bread, it can refer to a meal. You might say, why? Because that was normal that time. That was normal that time. It's like when you say you want to eat a Korean meal, there's always rice served. And then if you say we're going to eat rice, we Koreans are going to think that's a Korean meal. It's kind of like that. It's an Asian thing. And remember, Abraham was a Semite. <laughs> Let's look at this passage. You'll notice when he said morsel of bread at verse 5, verse 7 says, Abraham ran unto the herd and fetched a calf tender and good. See, it included meat. So it's not just bread itself. <laughs> Excuse me. I want you to look at Genesis 3. Genesis 3 and Genesis 43. Genesis 3 and Genesis 43. You're going to notice from these two chapters how bread is defined as a meal. Go to Genesis 3. And then also I want you to turn to Genesis 43. You're going to look at Genesis 3. And also Genesis 43. These two passages will demonstrate that when God says to Adam, from the sweat of thy face, you're going to work to make food and to eat, to eat through life. So then when he's saying that, that's obviously referring to a meal, but God refers to this when you look at Genesis chapter 3. Notice at verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou de uh, eat of it all the days of thy life. So that's basically anything that is grown from the ground, right? So it's not just bread. But look at verse 19. God defines it as, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. So notice that bread is defined as meal. There's no doubt about it. It's your diet, your food. Look at Genesis 43. Genesis 43. That's why when we call the word our daily bread, we're not just seeing it as just bread itself, but basically our daily meal, right? When we read the word of God. Now look at Genesis 43, verse 30. Genesis chapter 43 and verse 30. And let me know if I'm cut out of bounds in some way. And Joseph made haste, for his bowels did yearn upon his brother. And he sought where to weep, and he entered into his chamber and wept there. And he washed his face and went out and refrained himself and said, Set on bread. So this is the Egyptian governor, and he's serving a feast for his family. And then he says, Put a slice of bread. Is that, does that, what, it mean? Is that what it means? No. When he says set on bread, you can tell this is going to be being an Egyptian governor. He's going to serve them a lavish meal. So it's going to be a huge meal. You'll notice at verse 32, and they set on him, uh, set on for him by himself and for them by themselves and for the Egyptians, which did eat with them by themselves, because the Egyptians might not eat bread with the Hebrews. See that? So the, uh, it's talking about eating meals. You can tell by the language. Verse 34 is very plain. It's not just a slice of loaf of bread. Verse 34, and he took and sent messes. See that? A mess full of food. Messes unto them from before him. But Benjamin's mess was five times so much as any of theirs. And they drank and were merry with him. So you can tell this is like a Thanksgiving feast when the Bible uses the term bread. Go back to Genesis Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. Now look how Abraham is such a servant. He is such, uh, he is such a servant. He's good in servitude. Verse 6. And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah. So notice he's quick about it. He's going to be very prompt. He doesn't come in 10 minutes late, 30 minutes late. He comes in... Promptly, quickly, 
into the tent unto Sarah. So he hastens to the tent to where Sarah's at and said, make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. Okay, so meaning make ready, so be prepared or make the food ready. Quickly, he says. So he's telling to hurry up. Three measures of fine meal. So three measures, that term could probably mean about 21 quarts. <laughs> so that's pretty huge. Imagine uh, telling your wife that, all right? Hurry up! 21 quarts of fine meal. That's something right there. You'll notice that he tells her to make it quickly. So he's got a good wife who's also joining in the service, who's supportive in the service rather than questioning, rather than getting upset, because she actually does it immediately. Uh, you'll notice that she actually calls him Lord, if you look at verse 12, verse 12. She recognizes Abraham as Lord. So notice he's got a very good wife. So Abraham is such a good servant, and he's got a good supporter in that role. Not questioning, but helping in that support. Why? Both of them are serving the Lord together. Now, you notice right here that this is a lot of good verses on what a uh, Christian servitude should be. Christian servitude. If I continue explaining what each, words mean, uh, each and every word means at verse 6, they're making uh, three measures of fine meal. So the meal is absolutely fine. It's going to be 21 quarts worth of it. Need it. So this is going to be... Uh, Bread, because you, you got to knead bread, right? So then if she is kneading bread, notice at verse 6 it calls a meal, right? So then that's matching back at verse 5 again, bread. Do you follow along? So then meal equals bread again. We can see that at verse 6 and verse 7. So she's kneading the bread, and then she's going to put the cakes upon the hearth. The hearth is basically you know, in front of like some kind of oven or some hot place that you, some people put it on the ground where it can uh, heat up really well. So Sarah's, uh, her role is to be a great support. So what we see here at verse six is a supportive wife So you have to look at yourself right here in Abraham's servitude. Do I match that one very well? Do I have a wife who would support me? And also uh, being prompt, not late. If we are not late for work, if we are not late for class because we don't want to get a deduction of points, we don't care that much for the judgment seat of Christ? Good. Losing points right there. So that's why I believe in trying to be prompt as well. I remember I would tell my wife that, uh, oh, we're late again. And then when she was being introduced to the pastor's role, she's like, well, it's okay. You know, it's not a big deal. It's just that one time. And I'm like, no, because everyone's looking at the pastor. Pastor's never late. So here am I late again. So I cannot do that. So that's why it's important to understand that promptness is a big deal. Promptness is a big deal. We're going to look at verse 7. And Abraham ran unto the herd and fetched a calf, tender and good. So that's self-explanatory. He's r running to the herd where they're at. The moo! And then he's going to catch one of, uh, a calf over there that's going to be tender and good to eat. And gave it unto a young man, and he hasted to dress it. So Abraham gave the tender and good calf to a young man, and the young man was quick to dress it, to prepare the meal. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed. So he took the calf that he already dressed. And then he took butter and milk as well in addition. And then what? And set it before them. So he prepared the dish very beautifully, very well. And then uh, he set it before them. That's self-explanatory. I don't know how else to ex explain that. I feel like I'm repeating a lot of times when I'm reading the verse. But it's important. The reason why I do this kind of style in verse-by-verse -verse Bible teaching is so that you can make sure you understand every word in the verse. 
Everybody, when they start to read the King James Bible, and not everybody, but most people that I come across, they'll say, well, the Bible's too hard to understand. Well, that's why you need to attend church. Yeah. And I don't mean just a church, but a Bible-believing church Amen. that does verse by verse yeah. and explains it, and you actually open the Bible. You're in a church that actually opens the Bible and look at the verses, and you're reading it. And then when the preacher or teacher is explaining it, you look at the verse and see, is it matching? Is it making sense? Because like I said a thousand times, I could be lying to you, right. just like all those other preachers that lie to you, right? So you have to look at the verse. You have to match the explanation with the scripture, what they teach if it matches with the scripture. So that's why it might sound a little bit redundant when I do that or a little bit of a drag when I do that. But I'm trying to explain every single word, that's why. And you'll notice some of the difficult parts. This is good. In some of the parts that are difficult for me to explain it because I say, you know, it's just self-explanatory. I don't know what other synonym or what word can match up with that. That's a good thing. That means it should come as common sense to you that, hey, I already understand what these words mean. You don't need to find other words to explain this preacher. So whenever I say self-explanatory, that means it should be common sense. So that's why pay attention to that and go through every word along with me. Okay. Uh, let's look at the next part of verse 8. And he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. Abraham is a good servant. He stands by, all right, right under the tree. So they were eating underneath the tree because, recall, it's the heat of the day when you look at verse 1. So they're underneath a shady spot, and Abraham is standing by them while they're eating. So we see at verse 7, Abraham's a good servant. We see he prepares beautifully, beautiful preparation. He doesn't just do things last minute. He doesn't do things where it's half-hearted or halfway. He doesn't skip the volunteer sheet. He doesn't say, well, let somebody else take care of it. When they organize it, he's not, okay, let's just get this over with. Let's just serve the food. That's it. No, he makes it beautiful as possible. Beautiful preparation. And then you'll notice that at verse 8, stand by, I'm not done yet. You know what the problem with Christians today is? Once they do their part, oh, I already attended this event, I'm done. No, Abraham, he's like, after I serve them, I'm going to be ready for anything else that I can help out. So he is a gracious host. And that's what we're called to do. Look at Romans 12. Romans 12. Romans chapter 12. We are called to do that. Romans chapter 12. And then we'll read verse 7. Romans chapter 12. And then we'll read verse 7. And then there's a second passage. I want you to go to Acts. We're going to go to the book of Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. There are two places, Romans 12 and Acts 6. Notice that the Bible says that our calling is to be ministers. Now you might say, wait a minute, a minister? I thought you're the minister, pastor. Minister, what it means to serve. It means to serve. It's kind of like a waiter. That's what ministering means. So actually every one of you should be ministers. Pastor is a different position because it's a higher level of ministry. See that? Right. Ministering. Minister. Because he's really serving the people a lot through the Word of God. However, everyone is, biblically speaking, a minister. Even though office-wise you may not be called pastor or minister, biblically speaking, you are a minister. Of course, minister is different from pastor. I hope you realize that. But to a pastor, he can be called a minister. Let's look at Romans chapter 12 and verse 7. Or ministry, let us what? Wait on our ministry. So notice right here, Abraham, he is a good minister. Why? He's waiting. He's like, anything that I can do to help you, let me know. That's the idea of a minister. Not like, pastor didn't, uh, well, you know, I'm just waiting for the right time. 
or pastor, you know, didn't call on me to do this official role. So I'll just lounge. No, no. What you do is anything that you can minister or serve, you're like fully prepared and prepped up. No one has to tell you what to do. That's a good deacon. Look at Acts 6, Acts chapter 6. If any of you want the office of a deacon one day, the office of a deacon is extremely important. It's where there are good church member. Did you hear what I said? In order to be called on as a good deacon, you have to first be a good church member. You don't just become a deacon like that. Unless you become a very good church member, you can be called upon to be a deacon. You might say, why is that? Because a deacon's role is not teaching and preaching on the pulpit. That's a pastor's job. The deacon's job is, I'll preach and teach on the pulpit if the pastor needs me. Because I'm ministering, I'm helping him out, I'm serving him. I'm serving the people. That's why he's a, he was a good church member before he became a deacon. Because he was such a good church member and serving the people, hey, brother and sister, I'm praying for you. Going to every person, making sure that they feel welcome. Making sure that uh, each and every person is followed up with. Not the pastor. If the pastor is doing that, that's not good. Unfortunately, 90% of pastors, I would dare say, do that role more than church members, which is pretty sad. You might say, why is that sad? Because that's not our role. Our role is to simply teach and preach on the pulpit. That should be the people's role, or more so the deacon. Look at Acts chapter 6, verse 1. In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their, wor their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So notice that there were widows right there, that they didn't get the hospital visits they needed from the pastor because the pastor was out of town on some kind of evangelism trip. And I bet you it was a first-class flight as well. Or that they would say, you know, uh, we have a tragedy in the family. Uh, can you visit us? Uh, we need counseling right now. And then all of a sudden, preacher's at some kind of revival meeting, shouting, having a good time, while he's not over here to help me with counseling. See that? So this is a real thing. Ever since the beginning of the early church age, it's not just today, it's a real thing. And God recognized that. That's why at verse 2, then the twelve apologized to all the people about them and said, it is reasonable that we should leave the word of God and those revival meetings to serve tables. See that? That's important. But people have that kind of expectation of pastors. That's not good. Now, don't get me wrong. I actually don't believe in that myself. I don't believe that pastors should actually just go on to some kind of trips and then they neglect the church people when there are plenty of people who are hurting. The pastor should do the phone calls, the counseling, and etc. And I know of some pastors who are such poor pastors that they make great evangelists, if that makes sense. That's good. All right? I'm preaching and teaching the word of God, but then they make poor pastors. Because a pastor means a good shepherd of sheep. So a shepherd, he does tend to, he does tend and take care of the sheep. So don't get me wrong, I understand that, but you have to also realize this. You also have to realize that when he gets into that role of tending and caring for sheep, then he can't feed the flock. Do you understand that? The shepherd's job is to feed the, plot, uh, feed the flock. What does that mean? It's to teach and preach the word of God. If that teaching and preaching simmers down, which I don't believe in, I believe in giving you first class food. So if that thing simmers down because he's catching up in phone calls or counseling or doing hospital visits and then uh, funerals and comforting people all day long, then you're going to get this kind of preaching and teaching. You'll notice that at verse 2, the 12 called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wow, how about that? Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report. Look at that. 
that must mean they have a good rep uh, report amongst their church members, the church people around them. So they must be very good church members themselves, that means. Full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. So they know the Bible. They're also filled with the Holy Ghost. Whom we may appoint over this business. They, those are the people they entrust to minister to people. Verse 4, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. That's the pastor's job, is to be involved in prayer as well as ministering the word. Okay, let's go back. Let's go back. Oh, I forgot to mention this. You don't have to turn there, but with every good deacon, there should be a good deacon's wife. Because at Genesis, you saw right there that so-called deacon Abraham had a good wife. So the wife didn't say, I'm not ready yet, I'm sick, or, you know, now's not a good time for me, uh, uh, I'm going through my moment. No, she just did it immediately. She just did it immediately, and that's a lot of work. 21 quarts, verse 6, 21 quarts. <laughs> that's a large meal. She didn't go, ah, you know, can I have so-and-so help me? No. So this is important on to be a good servant in the church. Remember, you have to think of yourself as a position of a servant yeah. more so than a member, Amen. if that makes any sense. Amen. Don't think of yourself as a member where I want to hear good teaching and preaching and enjoy good fellowship. That's the problem with church members nowadays. And that's why they're not content to stay in a Bible-believing church. Yeah. And they'll find problems amongst it. Look, you're, that's not your job to be a church member. Your job is to be a servant. All right. Yes, you are to be fed. Yes, you are to be welcome. Don't get me wrong. But that's you can't be thinking that way. The pastor and the people in charge has to be thinking that. Not you. You know what you should be thinking? I ought to serve them. Same thing with the pastor. I ought to serve them. If everyone is stuck in that mentality rather than I should be served, trust me, you'll have an awesome church service. If you want to keep enjoying and keep up this role of a great church, keep that going. Keep that going, okay? All right, let's look at verse 9. Verse 9. Now let's look at uh, Sarah's position here. Let's look at Sarah's position. And let me know if I'm... Thank you so much. All right. We're going to look at Sarah's position. Verse 9. And they said unto him, so that's the Lord and the two angels, they're speaking to Abraham, where is Sarah thy wife? So, where's Sarah, your wife? And he said, behold, in the tent. Abraham replies, she's in the tent. Remember, when the term lo and behold is used, it's basically, here it is, right? Or it's a phrase that's used to pay attention. That's the idea. It's like a fill-in word for like, here it is, or look, or hey. Verse 10, and he said, I will certainly return unto thee. So this sounds like the Lord then, but it becomes more plain when you look at verse 13, the Lord speaking. So in verse 10, the Lord says, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. So God says to Abraham, I'm going to return. I'm going to make a visit to you again, but I'm going to visit you according to the time of life. So when he says according to the time of life, what is that referring to? When the time of life, what that phrase is referring to is when life is about to be born. So then the baby is actually in the womb. And then the time of life, see, life is about to be born. So it's going through that what it is, is that it's not actual conception itself, but the conceiving process. It's, being, it's in that conceiving process, the, the couple of months timeline. So when a woman is pregnant. So when he says that, Abraham's probably thinking, huh? Who's going to be pregnant? The Lord continues, and lo, so God's saying, hey, that's the same thing as behold, right? So pay attention to this part. So the time of life will be who? Sarah, thy wife, shall have a son. So he says, it's going to be Sarah, your wife. She's going to have a son. And Sarah 
heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. So remember, Sarah was inside the tent. Now door, we can, it's so obvious to us, it's like an entrance, right? So obviously during the modern days, they didn't have like an actual door like that in front of a tent. But the English King James Bible uses easy wording so that a child can get it. Basically, it's the entrance of the tent. So we can tell it's a tent flap, right? If it says tent flap, it's a harder wording. Door is easier. <laughs> so in, because she's inside the tent, remember, preparing the food. And verse 9, Abraham said that she is in the tent. She's uh, doing her role to be a good ser uh, servant. She heard it inside at the entrance of the tent, which was behind him. So the Lord was right in front of the entrance of the tent, and then she was right behind him. Verse 11, now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age. So both Abraham and Sarah, they're very old. We already know that. So that's ridiculous, says Sarah. She's going to have a child. Well stricken. So that term, well stricken, the word stricken is usually referring to health weaknesses. So str uh, st uh, st um, ugh, I'm slow. Uh, my words are going blah, blah today. Okay. So uh, the person is stricken with an illness or struck ill. The Bible will talk about uh, stricken or smitten with disease. So you're going to see smitten and stricken pretty simultaneous in your Bible. The word is referring to a health weakness or ailment. Now over here, they're not really sick. But nevertheless, it is a health deficiency, being aged. That's the idea, well stricken in age. So that's a health weakness, deficiency. Now, if we keep reading on here, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So, and it ceased means stop. So what stopped for Sarah? to be like all the other women. See, the manner of women is referring like all the other, or the fashion of that day. That's the idea. The style of that day, or what was normal, a normal custom of that time. So, after the manner of women. So, you can obviously guess what that means. It means that Sarah is not like all the other women, young women, who can be able to produce a seed, uh, who can be able to give birth, excuse me, who can be able to give birth. Now, if that's stopped for her and she's done with that, look at verse 12. That's why, therefore, meaning that's why, Sarah laughed within herself. So she was laughing, not out loud, all right? Who's going to laugh? Who's going to dare laugh in front of God? No one would, right? So she's laughing to herself saying, after I am waxed old. So you'll notice right here, waxed old. Waxed, the idea here is same thing with well stricken with age. It's simultaneous right here. It's simultaneous. The idea with waxed old, you're going to see that term waxed, and it means to increase, but especially with age, okay? Whenever some kind of age is mentioned, then this word will be referring to increase, but by the years. That's the idea, by the years. So it means to increase in age. So Sarah, you'll notice right here, she is full of faith in the Lord, and she believed that she's going to have a child, right? No, <laughs> the idea is it's obviously ridiculous. Let's go back. After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? So she's saying, my Lord, that's referring to her husband, Abraham, he's old as well. So how is he going to also have a child? But she mentions right here, shall I have pleasure? So there are two meanings with this term, shall I have pleasure? It could mean one, 
It could be that because they're up in years, they don't have that youth where they can have sensual or sexual intimacy and enjoyment as they had before. So then when they have that together, then children can be born, right? But then it can also have the meaning of having a child then you can enjoy, right? So when you have children in your life, then there's that pleasure, there's that joy. But they're both too old for that. So that's why Sarah was laughing within herself. Now look at uh, 1 Peter. 1 Peter. That's where you get that point at 1 Peter 3. Sarah called him Lord. So notice right here, ladies, that Sarah, she, can, she knew her position. Now, in this passage, you would think it's a negative passage referring to Sarah, right, at Genesis 18? She basically doubted God. You can see Sarah's sin here at Genesis 18. But even though, this is important for you ladies, even though she was sinning right here, she was still doing her godly role as a woman that the Bible recognized and used the passage that's supposed to be negative about her in a positive way. Do you get what I'm saying right here? So Peter, how is he going to use that? Uh, where is he going to find a verse where Sarah recognized Abraham as Lord? Right here in a negative passage. So what does that mean for you women? You women don't feel so down about yourself. You got to realize, yes, uh, it may be hard for your role as a woman. Sometimes emotions can kick in. A lot of thoughts can flood the mind. Feelings can flood the heart. And it's just very difficult for you. And yes, you are a weaker vessel. So then there are some things you can't take as hard, right? So that's very understandable. But nevertheless, God understands that. And he can still recognize the godliness and the good parts of you. Because here's something encouraging. So let's put verses 9 through 15. From what I see in Genesis is all negative, obviously. But then how God sees it? is something positive and he sees two things one sarah was full of faith now that's contradictory sarah wasn't full of faith she doubted i'll explain that part later secondly god saw her doing her job that's the point look i know you fail here and there but are you still doing your job oh i failed i messed up are you still cleaning those dishes are you still trying to uh, support the husband in some way? I know it's hard to hold back emotions and then close them out. That's very difficult for some women. And then sometimes it slips up. But have you been trying? Have you been trying? The Lord can recognize that. You're just trying to do your job. You're just trying to do your job. Now, look, I'm getting kind of sick and tired. So let me explain myself here. All right. So I'm in a liberal area. And I don't know, I do not believe in women being abused. So then there are some women who got upset at me for what about uh, I have an abusive husband and etc. Well, guess what? I get men saying that I got an abusive wife too. Okay, so it doesn't matter. The point is you both are supposed to do your roles. That's the point. If you got an abusive spouse, then obviously that's a totally different case. So I'm not supporting abusive spouses. I'm more concerned. I'm not concerned about your abusive jerk face uh, of significant other. I'm more concerned about you. So that abusive person, the Lord can just send judgment upon that person's head and get that person right with God. But I'm more concerned about you on your role. Okay? So if you won't get offended by that because I care for you and I want to concentrate on your role, not on some abusive jerk, all right? Because I've got, uh, I don't want to waste time on abusive jerks, okay? I want to spend time with you then don't get offended and just appreciate what the Word of God is trying to speak to you, okay? Please do that. I get so many negative comments on that. Okay, look at 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. If you want to be encouraged, then just listen, please, okay? I'm trying to help you out here. I don't know if there's any woman getting blessed or being offended right now, but I hope you're getting a blessed of what I'm about to tell you or what I've said so far. Because... It's hard to be a woman. I'm not a woman. I don't know how that feels like. But, you know, from what I studied and what I experienced, I don't envy your position. It's hard. 
Because why? You're a weaker vessel, okay? You're a weaker vessel. That's why there's a bunch of, bunch of beat men, okay, who can't take a beating for themselves, and they're like, I want to be a weaker vessel. So then they go, huh, and then they become like this. And then they just, what, they just want, why, they just go, flee to their wives. Why can't you support me? Why can't you work in a job? And yes, there are Bible-believing men who just sit down and do Xbox all day while their wives are the one working in jobs. Losers. Wicked. Wicked. I, uh, I know of some, all right? I know of some. All right, look at 1 Peter chapter 3. And then we're going to look at verse, verse 6. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Look at that. So she submitted to her husband Abraham, you, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and, not, and are not afraid with any amazement. Isn't that amazing? God says as long as ye do well. So as long as you're doing your job, right? As long as you're doing your job. Then God says, hey, I recognize it. I'm going to use Sarah as an example of verse 6 as a good role model for women. So even though she doubt, this passage is all about her sin, you can see that, even though it's about her sin, she doubted the Lord, she messed up, you'll notice right here that it's from this passage the Lord sees something good in her. Now, what about her faith? She had no faith. Look at Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And then we'll look at verse... Hebrews chapter 11. And we'll look at verse 11. Verse 11. Now look at this. This passage points out how Sarah doubted the Lord. Verse 11. No, through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because... She doubted him. No, she judged him faithful who had promised. Now, there's a total contradiction of scriptures. Your Bible's plainly lying. Or there's something the Lord sees that you're not seeing. If that made any sense to you. You know what you and I see at verse 9 through 15? She doubts the Lord. But God sees something else. No, she has full of faith. He sees what she could become, not what uh, she was. She can, uh, he can see, the Lord can see her as she will become a person full of faith. And that she will believe that I can help her in bringing forth a child. I know that Sarah's laughing, and I'm going to put a little bit of fear of God into her. But, you know, I know that she's going to be full of faith. See, women, don't keep... Uh, Diminishing your role, okay? Especially, don't let the world make you despise your role. Yeah. And then you get out of your role, and then you get out of the best position for you that's the most convenient for you. Why? Because the world is making you get out of your gender role. They're getting you out of your biological role, all right? They always try to put, look, uh, this is sound discriminatory, but this is scripture. Let's be honest. You women are weaker than men. You might say, why do I say that? I say it in that sense concerning biological wise because that's what helps you women to get away with a lot more things than the men. It's actually more beneficial to you. So we treat you more gently. We're supposed to be more gent uh, we are supposed to be more considerate of you. That's what the men are supposed to do. Whereas men, sorry, you don't get that kind of privilege. But I don't like it how this world is making everybody, let's all be considerate of each other's feelings. And that's why they lost their aggressive role and they became like this with Biden, you know. We'll sanction you. That's the kind of world we live in. That's the kind of world we live in nowadays. These people, they have lost their aggressive role. So then they act like uh, silly queer liberals just screaming on top of their lungs when somebody becomes president that they don't like and they just wail. And I'm not lying. You can find video clips of that. 
That, that's the kind of generation we live in. Yeah. Evil, wi wicked, weaklings. Just stay in your roles and everybody will be fine. Yeah, amen. All right? Amen. Don't try to, let's put it on an equal level. Equal level of what? What standards are you creating? Yeah, come on. See then? See, it's the government, the schools that create the standards for you. This is the equal level of where everyone should be. No, leave everyone to their roles. Butt out of my business. Yeah. But why do you get your stupid schools and government brainwashing you, telling you how you should do your roles? Why don't you let God tell you what the role should be? Now you reach it to the underage children, telling them what kind of role they should be and whatever gender color of the rainbow that they should be exposed to. Evil, wicked generation. So you might think it as discriminatory, but no, it's called re saving civilization. It's called playing it safe. Because once you get out of that role, it, it's a roller coaster downhill. You want evidence? Look at the past 100 years. All right. Anyways, when we look, uh, keep your hand at Hebrews 11. Keep your hand at Hebrews 11, okay? I want you to go back to Genesis. Genesis. So why is it that God sees her as a woman full of faith? Because God can't contradict. So I'll explain a little later on. So let's first talk about Sarah's doubting. So there's no doubt she, uh, she was skeptical of the Lord's promise. When we look at Genesis 18, 13, back at our main text, and the Lord said unto Abraham, so God speaking to Abraham, wherefore did Sarah laugh? So God saying, why did Sarah laugh? Saying, shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? So God's saying that Sarah was laughing to herself in her heart, how am I going to uh, bring forth, bear a child because I'm old? It says surety. So the idea is, how can it be a surefire thing? How can it be a certain promise? Because God's sayings are always certain, right? So how can something certain like that come to pass where I can bear a child because I'm just so passed over the years? So God is... Uh, speaking to Abraham. So God's a mind reader, if you didn't know. So just because you, there are some things you think you can laugh inside your heart, uh, you can't hide it from God. Now that's the problem with a lot of these uh, scholars. Do you realize how many pastors and scholars, I like how Dr. Upton did this in his commentary, and uh, I like to just a little, little bit park it right there. Uh, can you imagine these scholars when they read the Bible's text? That's a certain word and a certain promise. And they laugh. They don't, they don't dare say, ha, 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 King James Bible has errors, everybody. No, they don't say that to their people. It's to their heart. They go, <laughs> yeah, it says fetched, you know. It should be a more updated word. How many scholars and translators are guilty of that? They have no fear of God. And God, he remembers. And at the judgment seat of Christ, if you're saved and you're those type of people, all right, and I ain't afraid of you guys, but you guys are so chicken of me and then you're such, you act like liberals, whining sensitive liberals that you throw in comments. Oh, see, look at this guy, what he's doing. You guys, when you go to the judgment seat of Christ and then God's going to say, why did you laugh about my word in the King James Bible. Oh, I, do, I didn't laugh, Lord. I didn't laugh. And you're going to find that out. Sarah says, oh, I didn't laugh. And God's going to say, no, you did laugh. Yeah. He's going to record it, tie it in a place, and point it out. Yeah. Huh. All right. Yeah. All right, Genesis 18. Genesis 18. Bunch of scholars, idiotic scholars, taking doctrine lightly, huh? laughing about it. You know, <laughs> what's the big deal about the doctrine? They make a big deal. They're just dramatizing. They don't say that out loud. They laugh in their hearts. Right. You see that in passage with Sarah. Uh, that's a good sermon. I should preach a whole sermon on that, you know. Just make the whole scho scholastic world upset at me. I like it when I make them upset at me, to be honest. Amen. You know why? Because I get upset at them for laughing at the Lord's uh, doctrine and his words. Right. Right. 
It, it, bo it bugs me to death, angers me. All right, let's go back. Let's go back. Anyways, when we look at verse 14, God says, is anything too hard for the Lord? So God's saying, hey, is anything too hard for the Lord? So God's referring to himself in the third person. You notice that? Why? Because he has the glory. So he can refer to himself as that. It's like, uh, uh, this is a bad example, but you'll understand it clearly if I say it. If I call myself, hey, Dr. Gene Kim says, now obviously you'll take that as a sign. Of, this guy's full of himself, right? But the idea is, why would I say that? It's because that's how I think highly of myself. Right. Uh, same thing with the Lord. Does he think highly of himself? Yes. Is that prideful? No. Why? Because there's no one higher than him. Yeah. So he's just speaking a matter-of-fact truth, okay? Right. Speaking a matter-of-fact truth. And by the way, you should highly exalt the Lord. Right. No other person. Not yourself. So God's saying, is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, he repeats again. So at the, at, during that time of life, right, I will return unto thee. So God appointed a time, a set time, that he's going to uh, return to Abraham. According to the time of life. So that's going to be according to the time of life when Sarah is pregnant. And Sarah shall have a son. And God says, Sarah will have a son, will have a child. Now notice you get a little bit of the personality of God at verse 14. The personality of God that you can find at verse 14 is to get him to do a miracle. Now, you ever wanted God to do a miracle for you? Yes. Yeah, okay then. There is something you can learn right here. Verse 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? That's the key. Look at Mark 14. Mark 14. Open your Bibles to Mark chapter 14. And then notice what Jesus prayed. Now, do we believe that Jesus' prayer should be the best example of prayer? Can we agree with that? Yes, okay, then let's agree with that. Within the power of prayer, uh, let's see, I'm going to have to put a dividing line right here. Okay. Within the power of prayer, Jesus knew that he's going to have to be crucified on the cross, correct? Yet Jesus thought that he can make something worth it if he prayed to the Lord. So in the power of prayer, what you have to understand, in Genesis chapter 18, and we looked at verse, uh, let's see right here, verse 14, it matches well with Mark 14, when we look at Mark 14, Jesus started out the prayer with this. The verse says in Mark chapter 14, verse 36, 36, and he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Then he makes a request, take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but th what thou wilt. Now, why would Jesus say that in the prayer? All things are possible with thee. When Jesus says all things are possible with thee, he started that way because it's the same thing with God when he started out at Genesis 18, 14. Is anything too hard for God? Why? That phrase is used as, Lord, you have the power to do anything. And then you make the impossible request. Let Sarah give birth to a child. Jesus would say, take this cup away from me. Now, that's a, if Jesus is the greatest example of prayer, that's something you should learn from. If you want to see God do an impossible, and I mean an impossible miracle, you have to hit on his attribute. So you have to uh, notice right here, there are two keys in prayer here. One, you have scripture to use that. So use the scripture on the Lord. The second thing is you're bragging about his power. 
If you were to actually practice these, then the prayer could be better answered. And yeah, you could see miracles. Now, if you want impossible things to happen, then you have to get the God of impossibilities to get involved, Amen. if that makes any sense to you. All right, go to Genesis 18, and we'll finish it off here at verse 15. Genesis chapter 18, and we'll finish off verse 15. So God says that Sarah will have a son. So then verse 15, Sarah, she gets caught. Then Sarah denied saying, so Sarah denied it. She was saying, no, that never happened. I laugh not, for she was afraid. So she said, I didn't laugh because she was scared of God. And he said, God said, nay, but thou didst laugh. No, you did laugh. So then how is Sarah full of faith here when she lied on top of that, right? Well, the thing is this, the key is at verse 14, and you'll notice at verse 10, verse 10, God was going to visit Abraham. God was going to visit Abraham's household there. So he's going to visit Sarah. When he visited Sarah, look at the book of Genesis. This is what I believe. Look at the book of Genesis, chapter 25. Genesis 25. Oh, excuse me, that ain't it. Uh, it will be Genesis chapter... Uh, 21, Genesis 21, verse 1. And then Hebrews 11, your bookmark's still there, right? We're going to close it off here. Hebrews 11, and then Genesis 21. Let's finish it off. The Bible says in verse 1 of Genesis 21, 1, and the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. That's that promise at Genesis 18, I'm going to visit you. When the Lord visited him, uh, visited her, the Bible says, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. So the Lord helped out with Sarah where she became pregnant. Verse 2, for Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age. So it was during that time where the Lord visited her. And that's why Sarah was able to receive strength. She was able to be strengthened in her faith. Her life changed, so she trusted the Lord at the conception process. Because look at Hebrews 11. Why did she have faith? Read Hebrews 11 again. It says at verse 11, through faith also Sarah, look at this. What timeline is this? Not at that tent where she was serving the three angels. It was Genesis 21 when the Lord visited her, helped her with the conception cycle. Faith Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. She said, okay, I'm going to trust you to be faithful. When God visited Sarah at Genesis 21.1, Sarah said, I'm going to hold you faithful to your promise. All right, I'm going to put my trust in you. It's so hard for me. I'm old and I'm a woman. I have feelings. I have weaker vessels. I have a history or I have encounters. Or, but I'm going to choose to trust you because you visited, visited me, God, and I'm going to go out by faith and I'm going to hold you to it. I'm going to judge you faithful to your promise. That's why God says she's full of faith. That matches very well with you women where... I know it's hard, and you're going to laugh at the beginning, right? So then it's weakness, like Sarah, right? Your weak points. But what did God say? God said, in spite of your weak points, hey, I see you as what you could become, full of faith. And not only that, you're doing your job. That's good enough. And then so God says, all right, she just needs a little something. I don't know if you women got that before. You know what I mean? You ever had the Lord, you know, looking at your weaknesses, but then he goes beyond your weaknesses and says, I know what you can become instead. You're going to be a great woman for the Lord. And I know that you're messing around with the wrong person and you have your own goals and dreams and you're full of flesh and you want a comfortable lifestyle, but I see something in you. You just need a little visit from me. And God gives you that little experience 
where you hear a sermon in a blowout revival meeting, or when you read the word, the Lord meets you, or mostly you go through tragedy. You go through a hard time. And then through that, the Lord meets you and you finally flee to him. And that's when you finally say, Lord, I'm going to, it's so hard, but I'm going to hold you to it. You promised me. So I'm going to hold you to your promise. Make it work, Lord. This better work, God. This better work. And then what did God do? He held, uh, he held his promise and helped you. Have you women ever went through that? That's what you need. Did you hear that? That's what you need. You need something like this. When you do that, you judge him faithful, then you make a choice, right? I choose to believe that you are faithful and that my heart is in your hands and this mystery that I face today is part of a greater plan. I choose not to be discouraged when the sun will not break through. I have the choice of trusting you so, Lord, this is what I choose. So, will you women do that? Then the Lord says, you're full of faith like Sarah. I hope that will encourage you women. All right. Father God, I pray that today's Genesis studies have been a blessing to the hearers, increased our spiritual walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.